Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here today and welcome to Investor Training with 1000 Angels. Uh, so excited to have a lot of folks joining us. Uh, we know that you're all probably stuck at home, so uh, there's nothing like a fun webinar to provide a welcome break in the day. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that uh, we're going to be doing our usual session today, um, but I would love to keep this as interactive as possible. If you're familiar, you're probably all familiar with using Zoom by this point, um, and you know that you can chime in at any time using the Q&A button or the chat button, or if anyone would like to actually verbally ask a question, uh, feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you so that you can join in on the conversation. So welcome, it's great to be with you, and I look forward to this exciting session on startup returns, what to expect. So we're definitely uh, in a real inflection point right now with the startup markets. And I can tell you that even over the last few weeks, uh, I've really seen things change drastically in terms of startups that are coming to the capital market. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about that today, uh, the different factors that we think are gonna have an impact on the deals that you'll be seeing as investors, uh, what sort of returns you'll need to ask for from your startup companies that you're considering investing in, and how this might change the way you approach building a portfolio in the 2020s. Uh, so something that we've never seen before. So I am going to share my screen so that you can all see the slides. And don't worry, um, after the session, for everyone who's attended, I'll make sure to um, send you a, hold on, I'll make sure to send you a copy of the slides as well uh, so that you can use them at your convenience. So hang on, I am going to just bring this to the front. Okay, great. So I think everyone can sh see my screen now. Um, this is our April session of the 1000 Angels Startup Investing Masterclasses, Startup Returns Explained. So for those of you who don't know me or have not participated in one of these classes before, my name is Erica Diagnan Minahan. I am co-founder at 1000 Angels and Rain Ventures. Um, I've been investing for over 14 years in seed and series A companies. I've invested in hundreds of companies during that time um, and have worked with probably thousands of really exciting startups. So I'm really excited to share some knowledge with you guys today, answer your questions, and talk about what's happening in the markets real time as far as change. Um, given that we're in such a tumultuous capital markets environment. So, you know, the big question is when we when it comes to thinking about um, expected startup returns is how do we think about startup valuations, right? So a big part of the expected return for a startup investment actually has to do with exit valuations on the back end. And, you know, these articles are kind of pulled um, some headlines from last year, uh, right around the point where there was really a lot of frothiness in the market. So we saw startup valuations rising to crazy high levels. You know, we saw uh, a lot of the soft bank backed companies taking in really large amounts of capital at extremely high valuations. And, you know, there was really some question from investors um, as well well as startup founders around, you know, where were these valuations coming from and how and why did they make sense? And was there a chance that they were not realistic? So we'll be talking a little bit about that today um, and how the changes in exit valuations might uh, impact the expected potential return on your startup investments. So one of the big challenges uh, for investors right now is to think about how returns might actually change in a downturn. So we know that, you know, very quickly, um, we're seeing all of these sort of falsely inflated valuations come down fast, um, and it has a huge uh, a huge um, uh, amount to do with the fact that investors are kind of repricing multiples for technology investments. Um, and particularly as an early stage investor, you'll see that, you know, the impact of valuations on technology companies has a huge, um, is a huge factor in the way companies are valued in our market. So as things, you know, on the exit side, 
uh, tend to come down in terms of potential exit valuation, you're going to see that flow through to early stage investors and how we think about deals. So we do know that they're coming down, um, but how do we think about, you know, integrating the current market conditions uh, with where we are at the early stage and how do we expect them to affect, to affect our potential return on an overall portfolio. And secondly, how can we use this information to correctly evaluate startup return potential? Right. So as we're looking at different deals, you know, there's obviously the quality of the company, the quality of the management team, the quality of the opportunity. But how does that affect, you know, our overall need for return potential for from a startup investment. So a couple of the things that we need to think about are really sort of understanding the basics of how we estimate a company's valuation and then taking that in conjunction with capital market dynamics. So this is a big thing that we do at A Thousand Angels, which is to not only, you know, very closely monitor and analyze uh, what we think potential uh, exit valuations might be, but also to really kind of understand the capital markets all the way from, you know, sort of pre-seed funding through series A, through series B, you know, through potentially series C until we get to exit and really kind of understanding, you know, what do the capital markets look like that for that entire life cycle of the company. So a little bit about our secret sauce, we'll be talking about today. We'll be looking at some basic guidelines that will help you understand what kind of returns you should expect from a startup investment. And you know, as I was putting these slides together, um, you know, it really <clears throat> re reinforced to me the fact that at the end of the day, the types of returns um, aren't necessarily what gets affected, but what gets affected is how we go about structuring a deal to actually produce those target returns. So this is why it's really important to, you know, consistently be monitoring um, what's going on in sort of later stage capital markets, the M&A markets, you know, the IPO markets, so that we can understand how that affects our decision making at the early stage. So we are monitoring these markets so that we can understand as we're looking, you know, evaluating deals across sectors and, you know, across the various permutations of the early stage, which companies can actually provide investors with the best risk adjusted return potential opportunities. So this is a really important um, thing to think about, which is that, you know, because companies are always at you know, different stages and different valuations, we have to now sort of bring everything down to kind of what we would call like an even playing field to really evaluate it as a risk adjusted return potential. And as many deals in the market are getting repriced, we now are going to see, okay, well, you know, maybe this particular investment was, you know, the sort of highest risk adjusted return potential in the market. Now we're seeing things kind of trend downward. You know, there might be another deal that's a little bit more attractive. So how do we as investors kind of respond to this change in real time? And how do startup founders, you know, make themselves sort of aware of the new normal as far as pricing deals from the perspective of valuations to, you know, discounts uh, and caps on notes to potentially uh, changes in liquidation preferences. Um, and if any of you guys have taken my courses before, you'll know that there are some, you know, old school uh, deal terms that we haven't seen in, you know, decades like liquidation preferences of higher than one X or, you know, uh, discounts on convertible notes of over 20% uh, that we think uh, might be coming back into fashion. So the most important thing, though, is that we do need to understand our deal terms, but we also have to really understand what are potential exit valuations and how do we expect them to move as the current capital markets conditions change. So this is going to be, I think, what has the biggest impact on early stage valuations and early stage deal terms is the fact that exits uh, are a lot less clear at this point uh, in terms of whether or not they're actually going to happen. 
um, you know, I definitely have already heard stories uh, from several founders who, you know, were pre preparing to sell their companies, have liquidation events, you know, over the months of March and April that have been put on hold. So there's a lot of uncertainty and delay around exits either happening and also where these valuations will happen. Um, in terms of the M&A market, you know, other markets for potential liquidity for early stage investors, we're also seeing a lot of repricing and ratcheting down um, that is to be expected when there is uh, a pullback in capital markets. So the other thing that I think is really important to do as an investor is also to understand how to weed out deals that might appear cheap, right? So everything is not really sort of a function of, well, you know, this company had a lower valuation, this company had a higher valuation. It's really sort of understanding is the valuation appropriate and, attract and, and attractive. Um, and that has to do with, you know, what you learn in due diligence. And for any of those, any of those of you who are interested in learning more about our due diligence process, we also have some on-demand webinars about how we go about, um, performing due diligence on a prospective investment opportunity that you can watch. But some big factors in that are, you know, who's the team, what sort of traction do they have, and, you know, have they or have they not achieved product market fit. So every cheap deal is not necessarily an attractive one. Um, every, you know, sort of higher valuation, higher price deal is not necessarily not an attractive one on a risk adjusted return basis. So let's get into some of the details. Uh, so today we'll be going over sort of the basic of our, basics of return guidelines, which I think is something that's really important for both investors and startup entrepreneurs to get a handle on. Uh, you know, I always say the big surprise here is that the expected return uh, on investment is very often much higher than uh, both new investors or new founders ever expect. So if we look at, you know, this chart here kind of gives you um, a nice overview of, you know, what sort of cash on cash multiple returns you really need to actually expect at different stages in a company's growth. So if we look at, you know, a pre-seed round, which is typically a round of about 250K to a million dollars, um, you know, hopefully appropriately valued at somewhere around three to $5 million. And, you know, the types of folks you're going to see participating in these rounds are friends and family, um, accelerators, angels. Uh, and, you know, the crazy thing here is that the real expected cash on cash return that investors at this stage uh, need to demand if they're professional investors and they're not say friends and family that are just trying to help out, even though I always say that, you know, even those folks should get appropriately priced equity is close to 40 X. Um, and this might seem like an absolutely insane amount, um, but we'll learn a little bit more as to why this is appropriate. So for pre-seed returns, we're looking at, you know, expecting somewhere around a 40 X return on investment for seed rounds, which tend to be anywhere from one to $3 million with valuations of kind of like four to $12 million pre-money, uh, where you're gonna see, you know, more professional angels and angel groups, micro VCs, seed funds and scout funds come in there's still a pretty high return expectation of around 30x. And for Series A investments, which tend to be investments of three to 10 million, where you're going to see, you know, the investors actually put together usually a preferred equity security for the round, um, you know, and real VCs come in and actually lead a Series A, take a board seat, you know, have much more control over the company. There's still an expectation of around 20x cash on cash return at this stage. So, you know, I, this is a, a really important factor for investors to understand is that, you know, you can't go into a company um, expecting to get, you know, t double your money, triple your money. Uh, this is not enough to actually support building um, a, a portfolio that's going to provide you with uh, appropriate returns over time that are competitive with other assets that you could invest in. So the key to investing at early stage is to realize that even if this company can be, you know, a billion dollar company, uh, which, you know, I think 
is a lot to assume when a company is in these early stage, but assuming that the company is going to get to around $250 million to show in valuation or really anything over a hundred million in valuation uh, where it's large enough and valuable enough that there's an opportunity for liquidity through M&A, through, you know, potentially an IPO at the larger amounts um, or through private equity, you really need to expect that that investment is going to return somewhere between 20 and 50x uh, your initial investment, and it must be priced to actually reflect that. Uh, once you get to sort of the later stage rounds, like Series B and Series C, where you have more of the you know growth VC um, and private equity funds coming in, return expected returns now contract to sort of the 10x, you know, to 3x for later stage companies. And the reason that, you know, these uh, investors can kind of get away with, you know, uh, less, like lower cash on cash return expectations is because, you know, as you can see here in a series B, the round size is going to be somewhere between 10 and 25 million dollars with a valuation of somewhere between 25 to 100 million uh, for a series c you're now looking at much larger check sizes of like 25 million dollar plus with valuations of 75 million dollar plus they're deploying large amounts of capital so the ability to take that money and you know create ten dollars for every dollar that you've invested uh, is a lot more challenging right so as we get sort of further down the pipeline where you know, these companies are de-risked, the now demand for cash on cash return decreases significantly. And that's where I think a lot of uh, startup founders kind of think that they're over in the Series C, you know, 3x return expectation world when really they're more in like a 30x uh, return expectation sector. So this is a slide um, that I've actually used before in our valuation uh, webinar, but it's a great um, slide to sort of show you a little bit about how startup valuations move, uh, just a trend line. Um, and, you know, generally when we're looking at sort of pre-seed through, you know, series A, we're kind of looking at between three and $15 million dollar pre-money valuations. And you can see how the valuation of a startup is going to increase uh, based on, you know, the traction that the company has gained. And we can see that on the x-axis here. Uh, but also some other factors are going to have a big impact on the company's initial pre-money valuation. So some of the things that tend to drive valuation up are previously successful founders, uh, valuable intellectual property, um, definitely where they're based. So if it's a Silicon Valley startup or, you know, they just came out of Y Combinator or you're going to see some upward pressure on valuation. And then some factors that tend to have downward pressure on valuations, um, you know, which are not necessarily uh, deserved, but can create some really attractive investment opportunities is that, you know, if they're not from the Bay Area or LA or New York City, um, you know, if it's a startup coming out of Cincinnati or Detroit, you're going to see much more attractive valuations. Um, you know, historically, we've seen that there are much more attractive valuations for companies that have female or minority founders. So a lot of people find value investing there. Um, and then lastly, definitely consumer products companies tend to have lower pre-money valuations than tech, tech, than tech companies, uh, not by any fault of their own, but because very often um, they're considered less scalable for good reasons. Uh, tech companies can often take advantage of digital distribution channels as as well as uh, more reliable recurring revenue. So here are some factors that affect initial pre-money valuation. Um, but the most important thing is that as we're looking at valuation milestones for a company, you know, we really want to think about them kind of a little bit on, in sort of an order of magnitude sense, right? So, you know, you have a company that starts at a friends and family round with, you know, no revenue. Um, they're probably somewhere at that very lowest stage around the $3 million pre-money. Um, you know, by the time you get to kind of $1,000 a month in revenue, you, you know, maybe showed a little bit of something there, kick it up to four, but generally between sort of launching a company and really getting to around 100K plus per year 
in annual revenue, the valuations are going to uh, hopefully be, be between a, around three and five million dollars um, for sort of a typical company company that doesn't have a lot of valuable intellectual property. Um, and then, you know, the next uh, sort of inflection point is really a, a 10x jump, right? Around $100,000 in monthly recurring revenue or around a million dollars in annual revenue. At this point, the company is now kind of ready uh, to potentially, you know, get VC funding from a seed stage VC. They're a bit closer to, you know, getting a, probably a small, a smaller side Series A done, um, and at this point, you know, it becomes uh, what we would call sort of institutionally investable. So you'll see a jump in valuations to ten million dollars plus, then to sort of like the Series B ish stage. Uh, you will see, you know, valuations go to 25 million and then to 75 million. So one of the things to kind of note here is that um, in general, you know, we always uh, want investors as well as startups to understand that in order for an investment to really be considered kind of doing well and attractive, uh, you know, you almost always need to see kind of a doubling between valuations to sometimes um, a, a threefold increase. And that's why it's so important to appropriately value each round and not to, uh, you know, overestimate your valuation. If you set, you know, if, if a founder sets a valuation too high or if you invest in a company where the valuation is too high, um, there's a lot more pressure on the next round's valuation to be able to get that done. So hold on, I can see we have a question here. Oh, can we get a copy of your slides? Yes, you will be able to get a copy of the slides. So excuse me, we just needed to pop out to read that really quickly. All right, great. So moving on to our next slide. So you know, if we take sort of these different rounds and what we kind of traditionally expect a company to do over the course of, of the life of the company, right, this would be sort of just like a very typical, probably, you know, tech SaaS company, um, we can see here that, you know, the return expectations by rounds. And so we look here at a company that raised $100,000 friends and family, made some progress on that. Then they were able to do a 250K pre-seed round, a million dollar seed round, a $3 million series A, a $10 million series B, and a $25 million series C before exit. If we assume that this company was able to exit somewhere in the ballpark of about $250 million, um, which is approximately the target size that your startup needs to be in order to um, attract interest from potential acquirers. We can see that the friends and family investors will be getting about a 50x return um, on a $3 million cap convertible note. Seed investors will be getting about a 40x return on a $4 million cap convertible note. The seed investors, a 30x return on a $5 million cap convertible note. And then for a uh, $3 million Series A, which is done at a $10 million pre-money valuation, those investors would be getting about a 20x return. The Series B investors with a $10 million investment at a $25 million valuation We'll be getting about a 10x return and the Series C investors uh, who put in $25 million at a $75 million valuation would be getting about a 3x return. And I would say that for the companies that we've seen in our portfolio that have actually uh, done rounds of about this size and gotten to valuations of, you know, close to a billion dollars. This is what I would describe as like a very healthy uh, value evolution that actually kept all of their investors really happy. So, you know, this would be an example of kind of an ideal outcome, both from the investor side um, and the founder side, where they were able to you know, do appropriately sized rounds at appropriate valuations that kept returns expectations in check, uh, but also kept 
every single stage of investor really happy. So a company that kind of had this sort of, you know, capital raising history and was able to exit for $250 million plus would have every single class of investors uh, really thrilled with them. And, you know, why do we care about that? Well, obviously, uh, we want the company to do well and we want the investors to be happy. Um, but certainly, you know, we see founders who build a business like this, you know, have a really great capital strategy in place, have a great exit for investors. And then, you know, they take a year off, two years off, you know, enjoy, enjoy uh, the fruits of their labor. And then when they go back to raise another round, you know, they're able to sort of point to this and have investors that are really excited to back them on their next deal. So this would kind of be what I would consider, you know, really healthy capital growth for a company that's able to actually get a business to exit, you know, on less than $50 million in total capital. And that's a big thing that we look for uh, in companies at a thousand angels. So what you might, you know, be thinking having seen that previous slide is that it seems like the cost of capital is often a lot higher than people expect. You know, most folks are not expecting that they need to demand, you know, 30 to 50 X uh, potential return on investment from a startup investment. And most founders, you know, aren't thinking that they need to offer sort of a 30 to 50 X on that first few millions of dollars um, that are raised. But the truth is that investors need to achieve these higher returns in order to actually, uh, you know, at the end of the day, come out with a portfolio that works for them. And that is really competitive with the other um, asset classes that you could be investing in on a risk adjusted return basis, right? So we wouldn't be, you know, investing in startups if we didn't think that there was a real opportunity to actually uh, achieve returns that were higher than you could in public market assets. So I see I have a question. I am just going to jump over there. Uh, hey, Rochelle, nice to hear from you. So she says, uh, regarding the previous slide, I've seen some companies accept smaller checks at the seed level. So it looks more like a friends and family round with more investors on the cap table. Is this a typical and are there any inherent red flags in this capital raising approach? Um, <clears throat> so when we're looking at the uh, previous slide, and I'm just going to, sorry, I'm trying to toggle between questions and the slides. Um, so I'll just sort of move back to the slide that she's talking about. Um, so, you know, the, the terminology of, you know, seed, series A, pre-seed is very flexible. Um, you know, certainly everybody's kind of got to do what they need to do. And, you know, I will absolutely agree with you that um, sometimes when people are in the position where, you know, they need to um, accept investment, accept, you know, differently sized investments from individual investors, they're not necessarily going to kind of conform to this sort of very standard uh, path to, you know, capital strategy path or path to profitability. Um, so, you know, I would say that the terminology for seed now has been pushed down a little bit further downstream. So we would consider, you know, a seed round at this point to be one in which uh, some sort of professional institutional investor is coming in and we would kind of consider rounds that are, you know, an amalgamation of smaller checks of individual angel investors to really sort of be in the pre-seed department. So Rochelle, to answer your question, um, I think it's, you know, case by case basis. Not everybody is going to sort of neatly fit, fit into this bucket. Um, but this is sort of the traditional structure that I would say that our institutional capital markets providers uh, are kind of looking for as they, you know, sort of evaluate a company's capital evolution. So I hope that answers your question. If you have, uh, if, if you need a little bit more information or follow up on that, just go ahead and throw it into the Q&A. Um, so the big question here is why on earth 
does the return expectation need to be so high, right? Um, and so the main reason is because at the end of the day, the actual outcomes are very uncertain. You know, every founder that's starting a business is completely positive that, you know, in the next five years, they're going to sell their company for $250 million. But in reality, each individual investment is quite a gamble. Um, so what we're really trying to do here is to build a portfolio of investments, right? So if you have a portfolio over time, right? And so this is not necessarily on day one, but let's say, you know, over the next few years, you're building a portfolio of 10 to 20 investments. You're maybe making two, two to three to four startup investments per year. Um, once you're able to do that, now statistics are actually on your side. So, you know, if we look at some of the data from, you know, the last uh, study that was done on early stage investment outcomes, you know, we will see that about a third of them will end up in a total loss, another third, you know, sort of in break even territory, maybe a little bit more than that. And then, you know, somewhere around another third ish uh, will actually end up in a positive return. And so it's this information that leads us to understand that the reason that the cost of capital is so high is that the winners have to actually pay for the losers. So it's not enough for a successful investment um, to compensate you for the cost of capital for the money that you gave them. Unfortunately, they've also kind of got to comp compensate you for the cost of capital of you know, those uh, two thirds of other companies in your portfolio that are either gonna end up as a total loss or potentially as a break even. And that's what makes, um, you know, uh, investing at the early stage or taking a lot of money at the early stage very, very expensive. Uh, it's just that there is an incredibly a high amount of uncertainty. So if you kind of think about it, you know, in the, uh, what is it, the old like Monty Hall uh, three doors problem, right? Is that, you know, we're going to have three doors and there's only, you know, a, a positive return behind one of the doors, but we don't know which one, right? So we're basically sort of paying to open all three doors and the cost of capital is thereby increased significantly. So if the uh, target return potential on your entire portfolio is somewhere around 25%, we're going to see the cost of capital uh, closer to around 60% overall for those companies because a third will go to zero, a third will probably return approximately your inv original investment, and then the third that are successful have to now sort of make up for the fact that those other two thirds that you know you don't have a crystal ball, you couldn't predict, uh, cost you money and you probably in, ended up investing them in them as well. So I can see that we have a couple more questions. So I'm gonna dip into Q&A here. Um, great, so we have one from EB. In terms of portfolio construction, are investments ever made specifically for potential synergies like leveraging technology or human capital? An investment in startup A will support portfolio companies B, C, and D. Um, so that's a great question. I would say that uh, that probably happens uh, at the much later stage. So, you know, when you're more like a growth private equity firm, um, they're, you know, now potentially making investments in companies that can provide synergies. Um, I would say that that is uh, less likely to happen at the early stage, um, but for growth equity firms, they potentially would add things to their portfolio if they see that uh, they could be beneficial to either existing portfolio companies or other uh, acquirers that they have a relationship with where you know they see synergies can be developed. And that's where you're gonna kind of see companies too um, that are investing for things that could potentially be part of a roll-up strategy, um, and it makes a lot of sense. So that's a great question. Um, so, you know, moving back to uh, what we can expect from returns, you know, as an early stage investor, your returns are going to be really determined by three things. So most importantly, the potential exit valuation. 
Uh, then, of course, the future capital requirements of the company. So these future capital requirements, um, if they're large, are going to increase dilution. And if they're small, um, will have positive effects on your investment because they're, it's less dilutive. Um, and then, of course, you know, by the post money valuation of the current round that you're in. Uh, so for those of you who um, are wondering how these three things might be changing right now, you know, the one that is, is going to really be affected the most um, by what's happened over the last month is, of course, exit valuations. So we know that acquisition multiples are likely to decline um, because capital markets are just contracting and capital is going to be less available uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, we don't know, you know, exactly um, how it's going to impact every single sector um, because obviously our government is dumping uh, a lot of cash into the capital markets to sort of support these private equity firms and other buyers. Um, but it's likely that just the general disruption and lack of visibility is going to put some downward pressure on the exit valuation. So where before we might have expected a company to exit for 250 million, you know, maybe now it's going to be closer to 150 or even, you know, 100. So everybody's kind of going to be walking back those exit valuations, which will have downward pressure on uh, where what valuations will we're willing to come into a company at. Um, so the other factor that will compress uh, these potential valuations is that, you know, investment returns in other asset classes had the opportunity to become more attractive. So we saw on a risk adjusted basis. So we saw that, you know, really clearly when the market, you know, contracted down to, you know, just the, the general start stock market was down to about, you know, 18,000, um, you know, all of a sudden those assets became a lot more attractive on a risk adjusted basis. So cost of capital for acquirers, you know, will be going up as their stock prices go down. So for them, you know, there are a lot of other investments that they can make that might be more accretive than a high multiple acquisition. So rather than needing to take their money, you know, and go out and sort of buy a very expensive startup at a high multiple uh, of sales or revenue, uh, they now can find um, cheaper ways to increase value with the money that they have rather than, you know, needing to go up into the stock market uh, as their cost of capital, you know, changes as well. So we have to kind of think about that impact uh, on th that aspect of the capital market of, of the exits. Uh, the next one is, you know, future capital requirements. So <clears throat> this one is really quite uncertain at this point. Uh, we don't know 100% uh, which way this is going to go. And the reason that the future capital requirements of a business uh, will not necessarily, you know, go up or go down. We're not really sure how they're going to change is because there's definitely a chance that a lot of the startups um, that manage to survive this will actually be able to adapt to a more capital efficient environment overall. And part of the reason is um, that number one, you know, they're not being offered, um, you know, $100 million, $300 million checks by SoftBank, right, which they now have to figure out some way to use. Um, and just the whole pressure to burn cash by not having overcapitalized competitors in your environment can lead to a much more capital efficient way of doing business. So for example, you know, if you're a startup and you've got, you know, four competitors in your market and those four competitors are all, you know, burning through $2 million per month, you know, there's a lot of pressure on you to go out, and raise more money to be able to keep up with them. If all of a sudden, you know, those players you're not in the market anymore, you're now able to potentially build your business a lot more cheaply and a lot more efficiently because you can get in front of your consumer uh, without sort of that competition for eyeballs that can become really expensive. So the pressure to burn cash may actually decrease, which could lead to uh, a a decrease in future capital requirements for startups that you've invested in at the early stage, 
which actually improves your returns. Uh, the other thing is that it's possible that a shift away from spending on overhead like real estate, you know, offices for everybody, lots of travel for everybody might reduce some of the unnecessary costs that were previously built into our system that would have required additional capital investment. So we could see that the overall um, cash burn of startups in the new environment may decline, uh, which would actually be attractive for early stage investors because it means less dilution expected going forward. So I can see that I have another question um, from Bill. Hi, Bill, how are you? Um, so Bill asks, what about capital efficiency by industry or sector? Do you adjust your target company strategy towards lower burn companies such as software? Is there a general rule? For example, WeWork is a high capital requirement model. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is such a great and interesting question. Um, so the answer is, you know, and I love that you brought up WeWork because it's, it's a really interesting example of um, some of the dynamics in the venture capital industry. Um, so absolutely businesses that are more capital efficient are considered more valuable and are considered more attractive on a risk adjusted return basis. So we always want to be looking for target companies um, that have lower burn. Um, and that's why people love software, right? I mean, there's a reason why if you have a consumer products company, it's so difficult to raise money. But if you have a software company, you know, people are trying to throw money at you from every angle. So the general rule is absolutely uh, the the lower sort of capital requirements that a business has sort of fundamentally, the more attractive it is. Um, and the higher capital requirements that the business has, the less attractive it is on a risk adjusted return basis. So the reason that you saw companies like we work, you know, and other things that were um, kind of unusually capital intensive become uh, market darlings, you know, over the last decade is because these, you know, um, asset managers, so venture capital firms, private equity companies, the larger ones, you know, they basically get paid based on the, the amount of capital that they deploy. Uh, so it was actually in their interest to deploy very, very large amounts of company, uh, of capital. And it's very hard to, you know, deploy, if you have a $100 billion fund, uh, it's hard to figure out, you know, how to deploy a billion dollars in capital in a capital efficient business model. So they were actually more incentivized to go after companies that could spend all the money that they needed to invest um, with the hope that they could kind of manipulate the market on the back end through these sort of artificial valuations that would get them far enough to where, you know, they could take the company public and hope that nobody noticed that they had kind of like restru restructured sane valuation metrics. Um, so, you know, in a sane world, in a, you know, non sort of um, manipulated capital market environment, uh, we're always looking for capital efficiency. And that's why, you know, people love SaaS companies. So that's, that's a great question. Um, great. So back to the slides. Thank you for that question, Bill. So um, we talked a little bit about how the shift away from spending can reduce future future capital requirements, which can actually be beneficial to early stage investors. And then so lastly, where we're really trying to get to here is the post money valuation. So the effect of this is that a result of declining exit multiples will likely result in a drastic downward shift in post money valuations. And I can tell you, you know, from what I've seen, even over the last few weeks, I have seen deal terms on investments go absolutely crazy in terms of their investor friendliness. So we're seeing things um, being repriced at a lot more attractive terms than we've ever seen in a really, really long time. So, you know, the impact is real. You're going to get better deals. You know, this is actually... If you have cash and can afford to invest right now, this is a really great time to be able to get equity in early stage companies. Uh, you know, companies just want to really secure their position to be well, well capitalized to get through the downturn and they're willing to offer really attractive term, terms to investors. So just a little recap here for those of you who haven't watched my previous Valuations Explained webinar, uh, just to let everyone know when we're talking about pre-money versus post-money 
money valuation. So the pre-money valuation is just sort of the value that's ascribed to the company uh, before you make an investment, right? It's sort of how we price the securities. And then when you add in the new money that's raised, you know, you add those two figures together and you get the post money valuation. So post money valuation is a function of two things. Number one, the pre money valuation, which is, you know, a number that we kind of come up with to determine what we think the company is worth before the investment is made. And then the total amount of new money that comes into the company. So two things that are sort of uh, driving up your post money valuation are, you know, how valuable the company is before you invest and then also the size of the round. Um, and just to sort of throw in a little tidbit of information there. Obviously, this is why round sizes generally tend to have some sort of like an upper maximum because, you know, we don't necessarily want, you know, if we're expecting to raise a million dollars at a $3 million valuation and sell 25% of the company, we don't necessarily want to raise $2 million at a $3 million valuation, you know, and end up selling a much larger stake in the company of about 40%. Uh, so we can get into those details in the valuations workshop, uh, which we're actually doing next month. So I can see I have another question. Let me answer that. Uh, hi, this is from Hamant. Uh, Hi, Erica. Great information. Thank you. I hope I pronounced your name properly. I understand that not all valuations are accurate and certain number of startups are missed by the investors. You mentioned about the valuation and investment at the mock-up stage, right? And you mentioned about looking for a team while investing. Are there exceptions? Product Hunt didn't have a team and a technical co-founder. What if there's a startup that is bootstrapped but falling short of cash to build MVP, but valuation shows 300x returns to angels. Did you mean 300? Okay. Why wouldn't angels skip this investment? Uh, what dri drives angels' attention to exceptions? Okay. So I think what you're trying to say is, um, you know, if I don't have uh, sort of these boxes checked on my investment, how can I drive uh, attention from angels? So I love that you mentioned, you know, if I were promising a 300x return, would that be enough to uh, get their attention? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I would say that in, you know, 99% of cases, um, you know, you sort of do really need to meet some of these milestones in order to successfully raise capital. And, you know, if you look at something like Product Hunt, um, you know, which is a really cool uh, company that I think was recently acquired by AngelList, you know, if they kind of started off with, you know, uh, a, a website and they didn't have a technical co-founder and they just sort of put their product out there, but they were missing a lot of the things that people kind of need um, to see when you're building a business, uh, it's likely that maybe they were able to sort of raise a little bit of money uh, less conventionally from people that they had relationships with. So I think that, you know, when you're in that phase of kind of, you know, very, very early, you know, we labeled that as the friends and family type round. Um, you know, the expectation is that you're probably going to need to look for that investment from people that are in your networks um, rather than from angel investors who you don't have a relationship with already, right? So even angel investors, you know, if they're smart, are going to look for, you know, certain important key factors um, that you need to have developed in your business before they put money into your company. So, you know, just saying, well, you know, it's a 300x potential return is really not going to be enough. They, you know, it sort of needs to be de-risked to a certain point uh, that it makes sense for them to put the money in. So I hope that answers your question, but it is a really good question. Um, and, you know, part of the answer is that, you know, there's a reason friends and family rounds exist. It's for when companies are still in this, you know, very much pre-traction stage and pretty much the only way to get around that, you know, in 99% of scenarios is to, you know, have either some very valuable intellectual property or to have um, been a previously successful founder so that, you know, people are relying on that. Um, so at the end of the day, what's really driving down valuations and making uh, investment terms a lot more uh, attractive to investors is that, you know, companies need cash fast right now. Um, so you're going to see some pretty, um, 
you know, attractive deal terms and hopefully uh, some successful outcomes for investors who actually have liquidity to uh, add to their portfolio right now. Um, so one of the things that I've seen, if we look at, you know, three um, components that are the main drivers of sort of uh, value in, in a security from, you know, the way that a security is structured perspective is number one. Um, a lot of you, you know, at the early stage are going to be investing in convertible notes or safes. Um, and we have uh, traditionally seen discounts on these securities be somewhere around 20%. Uh, maybe 25%, you know, sort of at the high end. I'm actually seeing discounts on new notes that are being offered to the market as high as 50%. Um, so for those of you who don't know what a discount is, um, the discount is uh, what's applied to uh, your share price um, when the safe or convertible note converts into equity at the next round. So for example, if you invested $100,000 today in a convertible note or a safe with a 50% discount and that company raises a series A you know, a year from now, if the price that the new investors are paying for the security is you know, $100 per share, you're only gonna pay $50 per share. So your $100,000 investment will convert into equity as though you only paid $50 per share. So um, this is like, you know, something that I would say has not happened, uh, you know, in the recent future at all. Um, but I am seeing it in the markets now. So we're going to see discounts increasing wildly. We're going to see valuations uh, coming down significantly. Uh, I'm seeing companies that have incredible traction, incredible market opportunity down to valuations, pre-money valuations as low as $4 million. Um, and I think that the next thing that we're going to see is liquidation preferences poten potentially also going up. Um, I haven't seen liquidation preferences of greater than 1x probably in a decade, and we're going to see those now coming into play. Um, for those of you who don't know what liquidation preferences are, uh, they're essentially the amount of cash on cash return an investor is entitled to before the equity is split uh, with the rest of the common shareholders. So it's also a really, really important factor um, in terms of return potential and outcomes. So everything that's driving up potential returns for investors from a deal structuring perspective is happening. And the reason that's happening is because we're seeing potential exit valuations go down. So in order to sort of maintain our ability to achieve those 20, 30, 40 X returns on investments, these deal terms will have to change and we're seeing that happen. And it's because companies are really eager to bring in capital quickly. So we sort of talked about the ways that we can um, maintain our expected return through the crisis by changing the way that deals are structured. Let's talk a little bit about what it means for a portfolio. And I think I have one person in the chat. Uh, hi, Matthew Wilson. Thank you for your question. Great points. I think WeWork was also improperly valued as a software company instead of as a real estate company. So yes, Matthew, you're absolutely right. Um, they were pushing to value it as a software company, trying to pretend to be a software company. Um, and that's definitely not what they were. So that's, that's a really great point. Um, so what does this mean for your overall portfolio? Uh, and so I love to show people this chart just because, you know, it really helps to hammer home um, why we need to uh, develop a portfolio as we're making investments really in any asset class, right? I mean, when you look at your, you know, 401k or your regular brokerage account, you know, you don't have it all just in one stock. Um, you know, you create a diversified portfolio of investments and that's because as the number of investments increases, the actual overall risk of the portfolio tends to decrease. And that's particularly important with high beta assets like early stage investments and why we do it. So if we look at a few different diversified portfolios, we can really sort of understand, you know, if we look at it on an individual investment basis, why this is so important and why we need to 
uh, demand these very high returns from our startups. So we have three diversified portfolios or three, you know, potential portfolios here. Um, and we're looking at, you know, what's the overall portfolio return on an IRR basis uh, for a portfolio of companies that either end up in a total loss, they end up in break even, they end up with a double, a great exit or a home run, and how does that affect our overall portfolio return? So in portfolio A, we're looking at an investor who thought that, you know, it was just fine to kind of, you know, expect that a 10x return was probably the highest, you know, what they were demanding from their early stage investment. And so we can see here that, you know, if 40% of their portfolio ended up in a total loss, 40% ended up break even, uh, one of their investments got them double their money, and then the other one got 10x, which they thought was really wonderful, the overall return on that portfolio is only 10%. And unfortunately, 10% is, you know, kind of less than, you know, approximately what people have expected, maybe even just from the public markets, right? And so this is sort of a 10% annual return, but you know, your money has been completely liquid. It's been completely at risk for the last five years. So in this outcome, you sort of didn't achieve uh, what we consider our target portfolio return, which is around 25%. And then let's look at person B, right? So investor B got a little bit luckier. They had 40% of their portfolio as a total loss, 30% break even, and then they had one double, but they actually got two amazing great exits, right? So two 10X returns. I'm sure, you know, if you were an investor who had two 10X returns in your portfolio, you'd be bragging at all the cocktail parties about how amazingly well you did and what an amazing investor you are. But at the same time, even with this portfolio composition, we see a 20% overall return on the portfolio, which is not terrible, but we're certainly not meeting our hurdle rate of 25%. So even with two 10X returns over the course of five years, we've kind of gotten to what we would consider an acceptable return, not necessarily a great return. And then for investor C, who had 40% of the portfolio in a total loss, 30% as break even, and then they had a 2x return, a 10x return, and a 20x return. We're now much more in acceptable territory of a 29% overall return on the portfolio. And this is kind of really where we want to get to, right? So our target return for the investment portfolio is somewhere between a 25 and 30% IRR. And the truth is, in order for that to actually happen, uh, some of our investments need to get to sort of 20x-ish or more. And so that's why it's really important to realize that just shooting for a double or shooting for 5x your investment or even, you know, 10x your investment is not necessarily going to get the entire portfolio there. And the key reason is because of that 70 to potentially 80% that's going to end up either in a total loss or as a break even. And we must account for those potential outcomes as we're building the portfolio and as we're evaluating the current prices and potential cash on cash return of any investment that we add to our portfolio. So this chart, I think, is really useful for anybody to sort of, you know, understand um, just how the insane length of time that your investment is going to be outstanding affects IRR, right? So we have a schedule here of cash on cash return going anywhere from 2x to 20x, and then the actual number of years it takes you to achieve that return. So we know that when you invest in a startup, it's probably going to be somewhere between five years, if you're very lucky, to 10 years before you actually have any sort of an opportunity for liquidity. Um, and if it's a very early stage investment, you know, 10 years is probably the time horizon. So we can see that if we look at, you know, sort of the five to 10 year um, time horizon that our IRR for investments with these various uh, sort of exit multiples goes anywhere from sort of 7% for, you know, um, getting a double in, in 10 years, which we definitely wouldn't want to have happen, all the way to kind of an 82% IRR for a company that got a 20x return in five years. And really, you know, as we 
look through you know, this actual chart that shows us the return potential, we know that on any particular investment, we need to be expecting close to 60% internal rate of return for a company that is you know, sort of like at series A stage, relatively de-risked. And that would be a 10X return within five years. So that's why kind of you know, for these sort of later stage deals, we can sort of look at that level. Um, but certainly for earlier stage deals, you know, even if we're expecting a 20x return, you know, we could be looking at an IRR over 10 years that's as low as 35%. Um, and if this seems, you know, crazy high to you, just think about what they're charging you for interest on your consumer credit card, right? So, you know, pay yourself just as well as the credit card companies pay themselves, demand this type of return on your investment and realize that in order to actually make a portfolio work, the cost of capital needs to be very high. And as investors, if we want to be able to continue to invest and to continue to build a portfolio, grow it over time, and be able to deploy gains into new companies to support the innovation ecosystem, we have to make sure that we structure our portfolios in a way that allows us to be able to build wealth and to continue investing in new companies. So don't forget that to achieve a target portfolio IRR of 25%, those winners right? The, you know, hopefully quarter of the company in, in your portfolio that end up being winners really need to produce IRRs of about 60% plus to make up for your break-evens and your losses. So I want to just take a few minutes to look at some current examples that we have in the current market. So you can see, you know, some of the deals that we're working on and how valuations might be affected positively or negatively by the current market conditions. So, you know, one of the companies that we're working with is a really exciting company called Stylist. They're doing a $2 million bridge round right now. And they've actually been really positively impacted by the crisis because their business is um, a text, uh, a shop by text on demand service, right? So what they allow you to do is purchase anything that you need completely from your mobile device by text. You don't have to go into browsers. You don't have to set up a new shopping cart. You don't have to re-enter your credit card information a million times. And so they have actually seen their business take off substantially over the last few weeks. And why I think this is an interesting example, and you can look at this page to see a little bit about how we actually like the numbers that we use to analyze the potential investment return. And that would be, you know, the company's projected revenue, as well as the current amount of money that they're raising, the current pre-money valuation, as well as the future capital needs, right? So we take all of this information into account and we use it to calculate where we think we could come out potentially on an investment. So this particular company, we think that if they're able to get to about $300 million in total market cap, right? Get acquired for about 300 million, our investors will be able to get close to a 20X cash on cash return. So we can see that this particular investment meets our criteria. Now, why is this sort of an interesting, uh, you know, example to use to illustrate current market conditions. Well, this company came in with um, a pre-money valuation of $10 million, probably, um, I want to say, sometime last year, like close, yeah, about close to a year ago, they were able to raise at a $10 million valuation. And in the current market, even though they've been so positively impacted by um, the need for their product through the crisis, and they've seen a huge uptick in revenue, they're actually raising on a flat valuation. So we're seeing companies that have actually had significant growth and significant upside continue to raise on a flat valuation. So as an investor, you know, it's much more attractive to get in now when their market opportunity has expanded significantly, their traction has grown significantly, um, and the potential exit outcome has also grown significantly for the same price as somebody who came in on a much riskier investment about a year ago. Uh, a second company that we're looking at is a really exciting company called ForteFit that provides the software technology, and you know we love software and technology companies, to enable every boutique fitness studio to basically become a Peloton. 
Uh, so rather than investing in one boutique fitness studio that's streaming like a Peloton, we're actually investing in the technology layer that's going to power all of these businesses uh, with the ability to continue to service their customers and clients even through uh, shelter at home and social distancing. So why is this one really interesting? Well, they've raised some money before and they've actually raised uh, quite a bit from some pretty well-known venture funds. They're looking to add a little bit more capital um, to their balance sheet in order to take advantage of the fact that their business is skyrocketing right now and they have more customers than they know what to deal with that want to be onboarded much faster than they were ever expecting. So, you know, we use the same kind of valuation methodology. This company actually had four years of revenue projections, um, and we're sort of estimating that they'll probably need to raise about another $5 million uh, before they get to exit. And we can see here that in this particular scenario, given that the company is coming in with an extremely attractive valuation to be able to raise cash quickly in this environment, their projected cash on cash return is closer to 67x. So it is absolutely possible to see expected cash on cash return really start to get to very high levels as companies pull back on valuations, offer much more attractive um, terms to investors, and really, you know, provide what could be the opportunity of a lifetime for people who are willing to deploy cash in this cash constrained environment. So Forte Fit, amazing investment, uh, amazing company. And, you know, one of the things that I really love about what these two companies are doing is that, you know, these are companies that we had relationships with even before the crisis, but really seeing companies bring technology to help solve problems in the crisis is a big part of what makes angel investing so valuable and so rewarding. Uh, one of the things that we love about Stylist is that, you know, their platform is actually making it a lot easier for folks who are stuck at home, the elderly, you know, and really just all of us uh, to get the things that they need really quickly and really easily, um, particularly for those who might be a little bit more technologically challenged and would love to just be able to do it by text. Um, and then for Forte Fit, it's really exciting to see them provide amazing technology that's going to help keep all of our favorite fitness studios, our boxing gyms, our yoga studios, you know, my place that I go to, which I love to do my sort of high intensity interval training workout, um, to allow them to have the technology to be able to continue uh, to build their relationships with their customers, to build, bring in revenue through the downturn, um, and really to help them adapt to our new reality. So we love both of those companies. And I just want to thank everybody so much for joining today. It was really a pleasure to be with you guys. If you have any questions for me, please send me an email. Uh, my email is erica at 1000angels.com. And if you are interested in investing with 1000 Angels, please visit 1000angels.com. You can start a trial membership at any time today. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Thank you all for joining. I'll be sure to send everybody a link to the recording as well as slides if you would like them. So have a great week. Stay healthy, stay happy, and hopefully I'll see you soon. Bye.